Kia ora everybody, uh, Māori oho, Māori tu, Māori ora, ke tātou hongi e hui e tāike. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko tai tōku ingoa, tēnā au e mihi atu nei. My name is Tai, I am the A Sector Capability Manager at A Aotearoa. Welcome to the Tatiriti Lead Governance Online Panel Discussion. So just a bit about A Aotearoa, we're an organisation that is committed to a society based on Tatiriti or Waitangi, and we have a governance structure that gives due recognition to the status of Māori as tangata whenua and tangata tiriti as citizens of Aotearoa. This panel discussion today is with the current A Aotearoa board to discuss what is good governance and specifically through a tatiriti led governance model. We will discuss things like how decisions are made, how all board members can contribute, how does the governance group fulfill its responsibility to make sound, strong decisions now that allow for a prosperous future. Uh, I would like to welcome our ACL Tiro board members. Kia ora koutou. Uh, firstly, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for this korero. Um, I'll just do a quick brief introduction of them all. So I'll start with Jay Ruapapira. Uh, she is based in Kaitaia. Uh, she's Ace Aotearoa's board co-chair, Tangata Whenua. Jay has more than 20 years experience in the Ace sector. She has managed and delivered a wide range of programs as, and is currently cluster manager for Literacy Aotearoa, Te Tai Tokoro. Jay has governance experience with school boards, community groups and Far North REAP. She is a trustee and chair of Koro Kore Marae, the lo uh, her local hapu. hapu. Uh, Catherine Hazelwood, she's based in North Wellington. Uh, Catherine is A Aotearoa's board co-chair Tangata Tiriti. Uh, Catherine has worked in the government social sector for over 20 years in various research policy and evaluation roles. Catherine lives in Ofero Bay with Nick, where they brought up their two gorgeous boys, Ben and Sam. She was introduced to the ACE community through her work at the Tertiary Education Commission and fell in love with the intent and heart of the sector. She's proud to be on the board of ACE Aotearoa and to be using her skills and knowledge of the machinery of government to support the important mafi of the sector. Welcome. Uh, kia ora, Peter Jackson. Uh, based in Wellington, Peter has a strong background in business and governance. He is a facilitator for the Commission for Financial Capability, a member of the Early Childhood New Zealand Council, the Wellington Tents Trust Assurance and Risk Committee, and Tui Māori Council. He is a director of Tai Kuru Trust, Taranaki 10 Limited, Taranaki 217 Limited, Wellington Tents Lampton Key Limited, Wellington Tents LQGP Limited, Wellington Tents Trust Corporate Trustee Limited, and he's a trustee of Experience Wellington and Wellington Tents Trust. And you may get um, the feeling that our board members are very busy people. Yes, they are. Very talented. Uh, and finally, we have here today David Doe from Wellington. David is a senior advisor with the New Zealand Treasury with experience as an activist, elected leader, governor, and public servant. He understands how to keep strategies on track, make things happen, and work with people in good faith to drive change. David has more than eight years in uh, government, NGO, and education experience, including working in the area of adult literacy and numeracy. He is passionate about improving people's lives and expanding opportunities for everyone through education. So I'd also like to welcome Pale Saoni. He's based in Auckland. Pale is a leading figure within the Pacifica community and the ACE sector. He is a consultant in community engagement and co-design with Pacifica and Māori communities and financial resilience building for communities and Pacifica businesses. He is a member of the ACE Aotearoa Hui Fono Steering Group the ACE PD Grant Selection Panel. He is a Pacifica Cultural Advisor to Ako Aotearoa and a member of the Association of Pacifica Staff and Tertiary Education. Whoa, you guys. Um, so once again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and to everyone who's joined us, welcome, welcome, welcome. We've received your questions via email. So today I will just be asking the questions that we've received. Uh, so let's stop hearing from me and let's hear from our wonderful guests. So my first question, which I'm going to ask to all of you, what is a good governance? Catherine, would you like to start? Ooh, love to. Yeah. Good everyone. Um, what is good governance? Okay. Um, well, this has been really good for, or for me personally to actually stop and think about what is good governance. 
because you kind of just jump in and, and hope you're doing your best. Um, I think for me, um, and I'm going to plagiarise from other kind of people that I've heard, good governance is being with a group of people around a table with a shared purpose with a, a shared purpose, a shared vision to lead whatever you're governing. And, you know, I think good governance requires you to keep your head up and, and, and not keep your head up in the direction, be clear on the direction, um, keep the organisation that you're, or the sector or whoever you're kind of governing safe. So, looking at risks, um, looking at opportunities. Um, you know, and I think I think one of the one of the areas that can it can get quite tricky with governance is when you get a get a bit too involved in the doing. And I you know I think I think that's actually really common, particularly if you come from the sector or come from the area that you're governing, that you're it's really tempted to to get down and 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 and, and get amongst the kind of um, the doing, but I think good governance is about keeping your head lifted, supporting the mahi, not doing the mahi, um, and bringing and bringing the skills and expertise that you, that you have to the table. Kia ora, Catherine. Thank you very much, and well done for going first. Uh, Jay, let's hear from you. What is good governance? Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ngā um, good governance, th this was a really a good question, yes, Catherine. Um, I think good governance is people around the table um, that come from different um, experiences in life, um, um, different values, different cultures, having a full diverse sort of balance around the table, um, who focus on um, a purpose, who have a vision, um, who are, is aware of um, why they're there, um, what it is that they want to achieve, um, and being respectful to the opinions of those that are around the table. Um, I think good governance is um, a number of members or individuals gathering information to make informed decisions about where to uh, lead or guide and support an organisation um, to perform and make things better for, for the people that they're working for. So that's that's probably my contribution to start because I know some of the other questions that you want answered, um, you know, will start to paint the bigger picture. So yeah. Awesome. E mihi atu. Kia ora, Jay. Uh, Peter, what is your opinion on what is good governance? Uh, tēnā Apologies if there's background noise. I'm, I'm at home and it's a bit of a building site here. But um, I agree with what um, Jay and Catherine have said. Good government governance is about setting a strategic direction for an organisation, uh, making sure it stays on track. Uh, and that's by having strategic oversight of the business operations uh, monitoring and measuring the performance of the organization and its compliance with um, the laws uh, of the land. It's ensuring the integrity of the financial reporting system to make sure that the uh, that how business is conducted by the organization is um, to the letter of the financial uh, of the accounting principles. Um, and so it's our role as governors to ensure that we um, keep the organization heading in the right direction in terms of the strategic plan, but um, is doing it in a, in a best practice sort of way. Kia ora. Kia ora, Peter. Thank you. David. Uh, thanks, Ty. So some of what I'm going to say uh, echoes what Peter um, just said so yes it is about setting that direction uh, and I think also uh, trying to help um, look out and see um, you know what the organization needs to help 
carry out that direction. So making connections with other organizations, uh, other stakeholders, I think is um, quite an important part of just being aware of, of what you need to do as a board member. I think also um, there's kind of almost two, well, at least two, maybe more types of roles when you are on a board. One is to be a guardian. So try to protect the organization from possible risks uh, or, or looking out on the horizon for what could be coming. Uh, but then also uh, to be a bit of a, a driver or a star, so trying to you know push the organization to do more or something different that it may not otherwise do. So there's always a mix of, of roles to be a, a guardian or to be a bit of a star, a bit of a driver. Kia David. Thank you for being our guardian. Um, Bale. I only just wanted to add one thing to the current conversation, and that's really I'm Samoan. Um, my whole worldview is from a Samoa cultural point of view. So when I'm thinking about good governance, I'm also thinking about the um, culture of the organization and it's blending with the cultures that people bring in. So once we've got a fiscal and a, um, and a policy responsibility, there's also a cultural responsibility because it's the worldview we bring when we're talking in, in the organization that we're governing. So I tend to um, really emphasize that that's a really important um, aspect of good governance is that we don't leave our cultures at the door when we're having these conversations. In particular, where I'm involved as a Pacific Island person, people are looking to us to govern responsibly and with integrity from a good Pacific worldview. And so I think that's an important factor to remind ourselves uh, when we're sitting in that governance um, table. Bali, thank you. Uh, let's let's talk. Thank you very much. Um, that's a, a rich. See, we've got like five people here, and, and when you get five people in a room, you just get like the richest answer ever. So, thank you very much. Um, let's talk about the structure of um, a Saltiaroa's board. Um, um, Jay, would you be able to give us a brief explanation of how our how the a Saltiaroa board works? How is it structured? Um, yep. Um, so the structure of the Asaltia Law Board is um, we have two co-chairs and we have uh, two caucuses. We have a caucus of Tangata Tiriti um, and we have a caucus of Tangata Whenua. Um, they, the board members for each of those caucus groups are elected uh, by Tangata Whenua uh, and Tangata Tiriti. Um, they are, so we have equal participants um, in each of those caucuses around the table. Um, and that's the structure, really. The structure is a partnership between individuals, peoples uh, that uh, recognize uh, the Tiriti partnership and the uh, obligation and commitment and responsibility. Uh, to partner with each other around making future decisions for the organisation and for the people that we uh, deliver our services to. So that's my whakaro around uh, the actual structure uh, of the board. Um, happy to have uh, the members contribute and add more to that. Um, but yeah, that's my whakaro around the actual structure and how it is. We have two co-chairs. Uh, that's elected by the uh, two caucus groups, which is Tangata Whenua and Tangata Tiriti. So our Tangata Whenua uh, ropu, of course, um, is uh, Māori, um, and our Tangata Tiriti are um, our New Zealanders. Anyone um, who is a current New Zealander um, and um, those that we partner with. Oh, thank you, Jay. Um, so, my, probably my first question I'm going to follow up with is, how do you make decisions with the two caucuses? Uh, I think the decisions are made together, regardless of which caucus um, that we discuss and deliberate um, um, plans, strategies. Um, at the end of the day, I think the decisions always come back and are made together. 
that's my whakaro, and that's my experience as being on this board. Um, I think the caucuses are really to deliberate um, and to ensure that, I think Peter raised it earlier, that the responsibilities um, and the culture and uh, the people that we filter our culture and experiences are Māori. So, of course, everything that comes on the table um, is filtered through my lens as a Māori. Um, how is it this decision going to impact um, Māori in the long run? Um, so, yeah, and I think so. That's that's my experience on this board is regardless of our two caucuses, our caucus uh, ropu have um, opportunities to deliberate um, in their separate groups, but the decisions are always made together. All right, thanks, Jay. Um, Catherine, I'm going to ask the next question to you. So there are two co-chairs. <clears throat> Who has the final say? Um, I think I'll just continue how Jennifer's, um, Jay's put it, because the experience I've had on, on, on the board for the last few years is that it's, a, it's the, the decisions are made at the table. It's not a, we've never had a, not, we've never had a situation where it's been, uh, um, we've been at an impasse or, or we can't make a decision because as a, the collective we have around the table, there is, it, it, it it works. There's that respect. There's the there's the space to debate, um, or if need be. But I don't. It, it doesn't. It feels like it's a it's a it's a group decision. We haven't had to have a well. Who's gonna you know which which chair has to make a decision? I don't know if the, in the past if that's actually been a, been an issue. But it doesn't. It, the whole way this has been the whole way this is set up is that. It is, it is a partnership and it comes with the respect and understanding and and we are as a collective working together um, for the greater good of Ace Aotearoa and the sector. So um, yeah, I don't know who anyone else wants to add. Good, Catherine. Sounds like, it sounds like you get on. You've got something <laughs> to say, Jay? <laughs> if I can just add to that, I think um, there is no final decision other than what the board decide. I think when it comes down to who makes the final decision between the co-chairs, um, I think there needs to be a good understanding and respect uh, for each other in those roles or in that position as co-chair um, and an understanding of, um, again, the organisation, what it is you're wanting to achieve. So I think all those um, discussions are had um, informally to decide on, okay, um, who's going to, or who's able to, I think is the question um, when it comes to making decisions. So yeah, kia ora, kia ora tai. Kia ora, thank you. Peter, I'm going to ask the next question to you. Um, how do you get every board member to contribute in a discussion or decision? Um, when I have had the occasion to chair other boards or other meetings, um, I've always thought about whose voice or opinion is really, really important to hear. And so some people are naturally quieter, but there are occasions where you want to get someone's point of view on record. And so as chair, I would directly ask them what they think so that we can capture their thoughts. From a, another perspective, and it's, I've never experienced it on this board, but sometimes you get those people who after the meeting is over, moan about a decision or moan about a, a point that was made and they never took the opportunity to voice that point. So if you, if you know that you've got someone that's prone to doing that, that, again, it's important to actually ask them their opinion so that they can't actually um, complain about any decision made because they've had their say. So it's about directing from the chair in that instance. Thank you. Bali, I'm going to ask you the next question. So uh, you're a, you told us you're Samoan, you're a Pacific board member. How do you feel uh, we as Pacific fit within a Tatirisi-led governance model? How do we fit into this? Um, I think 
Hello for everyone. Thank you for the question, Tai. Um, for a start, um, I'm sitting in my waka, which is um, how Māori really began to talk to Pacific. No, kidding. <clears throat> um, I think this is a really, uh, it's a wide question, Tai, because um, I still consider myself tauiwi when it comes to relationship to Māori and that I'm from Samoa, I'm not off this land. And so I treasure any relationship with Māori because the manaki for us as Pacific is huge to be able to come from El Motu to this huge one and to be welcomed on. We differ a lot with Māori politically and culturally and socially, but the place where we whakapapa to is undeniable. We have a whanaungatanga that's unique to the relationship that we have with tangata whenua. So I'd like to start there. When I'm on a board, um, I look around the room and I check that I'm uh, in the right place uh, when tangata whenua are involved. So um, I won't talk just about the ACE board, but I'll talk about other boards that I'm in. Often, I'm the only brown person. <laughs> And so um, I'm a real advocate to employ um, or to recruit um, Māori into those spaces. So in a way, my relationship with Māori is to privilege Māori wherever I can um, as a part of the whanaungatanga uh, relationship. In the ACE board, um, it's like a tuakana tena relationship. Um, there's a real reciprocity um, in the talanoa or in the conversation, keeping in mind all the things we've just talked about, about policies and the culture of the organization. But I'm more likely to, um, uh, to have my place as tauiwi. If you think about the process on marae, um, there's tangata whenua and then there's tauiwi. So I see myself as one of those people that are welcomed in to marae and I see the same in the board. Um, I see myself as welcomed into the board. And then of course, once you're in there and you're building that trust, the human side of me comes in, which is the other part, the Pakya. Talk about often where you then feel comfortable to then put your view forward. Um, it's a safe place. And often boards will do team building to encourage um, you know, the, 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 the trust. Um, amongst us. So in the ACE board, I've never felt um, undermined as Pacific um, or Samoan. I've never felt that I couldn't put my views forward. I felt um, that it's been accepted um, for whatever those uh, views might be or decisions for Pacific because they, the, the board know that I don't represent all the Pacific Islands, um, although I can bring notions of it to the Talanoa, but I've always felt that it's been accepted in the board because we've done a whole lot of that other work prior to that. I think the hardest feeling as a Pacific is in the school uh, boards, and I've spoken to a number of um, people, in particular women, who have been seconded onto those boards because they've got kids at the school, but they've arrived with no skill to be involved in a board decision. And so as Pacific, they're now doubly shy to comment because they've got no skills to help govern, but then their pacificness is, is shy. They're too scared to put their, um, their thoughts forward. So there's some tension in some of those things, but it's a, there's a continuum, I think. But as a Pacific person, I guess I've developed a confidence over the years. I've um, talked with Māori. I've you know done a bit of homework to make sure that I've got all that humanist stuff sorted. Um, I remember when the ACE board uh, did a strategic plan recently, we went through a tetra mapping um, uh, um, process. And in the tetra mapping, for those who are not familiar, it really helped us as a board understand that actually, um, Peter was the only one that had any decision-making confidence. All the rest of us were useless because we were off an element that was more about, um, oh, I prefer the person I'm 
you know, well, how does the person feel? You know, is it going to hurt the person if we make this decision? Whereas Peter was one of those elements that was the earth element that just said, here's the decision and we're going to go with that. And so in the Pacific and Māori space, it's exactly the same for me. It's understanding that humanness about us that can work together to get to that point. I'm not some, someone that kind of um, blames culture for the way we behave um, in a forum like the board. Um, I've gone through those processes and this little um, answer in the hope that people can get a little bit more of um, how it feels like for me in the board. I hope that's helpful. Good up, Ali. Um, and as you may notice, they, if this board gets on well, um, humour seems to be something that keeps them going. Um, David, let's ask you a question. Um, how does the board contribute to ACE Aotearoa's strategy? Yeah, so um, I guess I'm still relatively new to the board, but I will outline, I guess there are two halves to that. So one is uh, actually de helping develop the strategy in consultation with staff and, and members. Uh, and the second half is actually making sure that um, Asantoro is actually doing the things required to um, make that strategy happen. So in terms of the first half, there was an extensive uh, exercise done over, I believe it was 2020, 2021. Uh, I think Catherine and Jay can uh, correct me on that. So where there was quite an extensive mapping of actually where, where is ASAL Tero now? Uh, what is, where is the education sector now? Where is it heading? Um, what are the trends? And then also based on all that mapping, then we started to think about, okay, given uh, that's where we are, uh, you know, where could we go? And that, that leads to uh, those, uh, four or five priority areas that people see in the, the diagram that, that makes up our strategy. And so that is our very key uh, reference point for whatever um, we do. Then the second half of just more kind of what a board does you know, on an ongoing basis is, you know, asking questions, uh, particularly of the Timuaki director about, you know, how is the strategy going? You know, what sort of things are actually happening or not happening uh, that support the areas in that strategy? Um, so, yeah, it's kind of developing the strategy and then asking questions and seeing what, what other help is needed to make sure that is actually, that strategy is actually um, happening. So two halves there. Sure. Thank you, David. Um, Jay, I'm going to ask you another question about the, the structure of Ace Aotearoa's board. Just curious, um, what are the challenges that may have popped up and how, did, how do you overcome them as a board? Hmm, challenges. <clears throat> Maybe there are opportunities. Maybe I should look at it in the positive. <laughs> um... I actually can't think of a challenge that we haven't been able to discuss and work together to solve um, or actually come up with solutions to address um, some of those challenges. I think um, with policy changes, with government changes, I think that always creates some challenges around the table around um, how the, it's going to impact ACE Aotearoa as an organisation. Um, again, I think we sort of lean on Annalise, um, our director, to actually uh, be the driver to gather information um, and represent us at some of those uh, discussions. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the, the right the question. Sounds like Catherine, Catherine, anyone? jump in. <laughs> Catherine, jump in. <laughs> uh, well, no, I think you were, um, because I, I agree. I think since I've been on the board, there have been a number of challenges um, that the board has worked through. Sometimes it takes a while. It's not, you know, we, we only meet um, at certain times in the year. We're not together all the time. So some challenges have flowed over. Um, I think a, um, one, one challenge that I think we are working through is around, um, which is kind of relevant for, for what we're talking about, is how to ensure the board election process is mana enhancing um, for um, outgoing board members and incoming board members and, and how do we um, attract, um, attract people to the board. So these are kind of 
things that we're working through through as a board and um yeah but I, but I agree around you know we do lean on on our on our wonderful director to um to help us um if we've got issues or, or things we want to work through you know to to ask the organization to come and to come back to us with more information so we can we can keep talking about it um yeah yeah Pete, I think Peter had his hand up before yeah well I do have a point um often with a with a, a two-house model I mean you run the risk for example of Pacific and not uh, of Pacific and not um having a seat around the table because it's quite conceivable um and, uh, and uh, difficult in this sense because Palia is just such a dynamic person and personality but um it's possible that the board would not couldn't at some stage not have a Pacifica uh, member which means that we uh, in a sense touch with the Pacifica community in New Zealand um and so the two house model doesn't lend itself to that. Um, another perhaps potential problem with the two house model is the fact that, um, you know, my, my, one of my great, great grandfathers was, was European. So in a sense, I could stand on, on the Tangata Treaty side as well if I decided to, which in a sense seems a bit unfair because if, if you don't have um, Maori ancestry, well, then you are not able to stand on the mana whenua side. So you know, you know, there are there are issues, but I also wanted to um, um, give more information about what Catherine spoke about in terms of how to make it mana enhancing for outgoing board members. And our old practice was that we'd have a vote, uh, vote in new board members or a board election at our AGM. And so what would happen is that you'd make all your plans and go down to the AGM, wherever it might be, um, and could be in Christchurch, fly down there, have your hotels all sorted, set your workload aside for the time of the conference and be voted off. And you're stuck down in Christchurch. And it's kind of, um, it's not a good practice in a sense because and we're, we're discussing that to, to ensure that it is more mana enhancing. So, yeah. Um, Holly, you got any words to say as a dynamic Pacific superstar? <laughs> Sorry, I was just basking in the glory of that comment for a little while. I forgot what, what we were here for. You know, I didn't really, I, I mean, that's a, it's an unusual question, eh? I mean, we think about the things that are challenging because there are a number, but again, at what level do we discuss um, what's challenging? Because I, I think um, in, any, in, in any board, to me, the most challenging thing is the personality stuff. It's such an important thing in a board and has been raised this right at the beginning. <clears throat> it's the, the challenges can be really overcome quickly in any board um, if the personalities and the trust is gelling really well. So, you know, I could raise some things about, I remember a few years ago, thanks Peter, there were some Pacific issues that were really difficult. If I'd been a shy person, I wouldn't have raised them. And there was a Pacific person that was working with me at the time and I was trying to support that person um, with the subject, but it took a bit of humor. It took a bit of, um, you know, schmoozing, I guess, around trusted personality to then present the issue. And then it was a breeze to have it kind of talked about, um, unpacked, found a strategy forward and a decision was made. And although the decision was not favorable in terms of Pacific, but I felt that we were heard, that's a, that's a plus. But that could only have happened because the personalities were such that the trust was there. And so it doesn't matter how heavy the challenge or how big the challenge. When Peter was talking about the two house models, I've always said the two house model doesn't suit Pacific right from the beginning. But I always felt we needed to have that to actually embed the knowledge of the board at that time around being treat, uh, treaty led. So once you've done that 
and you've got a good board that understands that, basically you could drop the two house model and you could just do it with the trust and the personalities within it. But that's just my thoughts about the two house model, which I think we're about to discuss that for the next time we get together as a board, eh? when we get together um, in June. And so that's great that it's current and it's, and it's honest and it's transparent. And I think, yeah, wonderful. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Davis, do you have anything you can add? Uh, I think for me, it just comes down to um, a core set of um, behaviours, I guess, uh, as a board member. And to me, in terms of, you know, how do we ensure governance is uh, Tariti lead, I guess it's, to me at least, it's fundamentally just about, you know, about number one, listening, uh, secondly, respecting everyone's views, particularly of Tangata Whenua, and then thirdly, um, ensuring there is that space uh, for Tangata Whenua and to heed what is said. Um, that's probably my main sort of tips for people who might want to join a board. Um, and that's what I try to do as much as I can in terms of, you know, here on this board and, and in other settings. All right. Thanks, David. Quick question, Catherine. Maybe, maybe it's not. How do you start? How do you become a facility lead governance group? What do you do? Well, when I um, looked at, when I first came onto the board, um, not actually, to be honest, not knowing much about what um, a treaty led organisation would actually look like in practice. Um, and it's not, it's not like I haven't over the years through school and university and in my own world, you know, um, learned a lot about the treaty. I'd never, and as a government, in the government, gosh, it's, you know, it's a standard question when you go for a job interview, how do you? But I've never seen it actually in practice, to be honest. I've only ever seen it as words and documents, but never actually down to the next kind of, I guess, operational level. So I guess it's a long way of saying that um, the, the, the constitution has it, we have it in our constitution for um, ACE Aotearoa, we have it bedded into our strategy, um, even more so with this, with, with this new, new strategy, it's, it's really called out in all the different parts. And it's actually bedded, and the model is bedded into how we practice and then overlaying that you have people around the table that understand it and operate in that way and I think if you start taking out some of the things that sit above then you're really relying on um, people um, a bit too much I think I think having it having it bedded in and all the different layers is really important um, and to debate the two house model I think yes it's a really good it's always healthy to um, see if it's still fit for purpose and if it needs to evolve. And, you know, that's, that's, the, um, that's going to be the strength of keeping this alive. But I do think to, you have to have it and all that. You have to have the whole structure. You, it's not just about coming in with the, with the right intent. Um, so how to start? Well, I think one of the things that we're going to do as a board is, is um, within our strategy, we're going to, demonstrate leadership in it, we're going to model it, we're going to um, uphold a treaty-based framework. So we're going to get better at articulating to the world, this is actually what it looks like, to help people get started, really. Um, particularly in the ACE sector, I think, you know, this is the, 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 perfect, the perfect sector that actually, and maybe then government can actually see what it actually really does look like. Yeah. Have a look at um, ACE Aotearoa's constitution if you want to see more about how it's been put into the year. Um, so here's a question anybody can answer. What makes a good governance member? Uh, what makes a good governance member? I think, um, yeah, definitely honesty, integrity, someone who's a good listener, someone who's prepared to learn, uh, someone who um, has a passion for, for the kaupapa, um, someone who's prepared to use the skills that they have um, to contribute to the discussions. Um, someone who wants to be a part of a learning environment uh, where others can stretch you, challenge you, grow you. Um, and sometimes someone who's prepared to jump into 
uh, a huge challenge. <laughs> uh, so those are all some of the things that I think uh, makes a good governing member. Um, look, I may have been a part of different boards um, for, you know, 25, 30 years now on different um, levels for different places or organisations. Um, but you're always learning. That's, that's one of the key things that I've learnt going from a board to a trustee to uh, a director to a, all of those kind of things. You will always learn something new. Uh, you meet good people, you meet new people, you meet challenging people, um, and you learn. It helps you grow yourself um, and, um, yeah, and learn to respect other people's opinions matter if not to you, <laughs> definitely to someone, um, you know, and and practice to agree to disagree, and it's all right. So, yeah, kia ora, right. that's my two cents. Thanks, Jay. David, what do you think makes a good governance member? Yeah, I think it's um, maybe three or four things come to mind, um, which echo a bit of what Jay says. So one, one is obviously caring, caring for the organisation that you are a board member of and caring about what it what it does. That's kind of it's kind of a basic precondition. <laughs> uh, you need to care about what you do and what, why you're standing. Second, I think, is um, sort of seeing, so seeing ahead. Um, and part of that seeing is part of listening, sort of seeing, you know, what is in, in the environment that your organisation is in and what is coming up and being aware of relevant um, developments like policy or government or you know, how people are feeling about certain certain things. Um, and probably the third one is just having a really um, critical mind, always asking questions. So we, so as a board, we do get board papers for each meeting. And so a number of reports about uh, what has been happening or not happening and proposals about what we could do and not do. And so a key part of being uh, a good board member is asking questions, uh, curious questions, as well as um, scrutiny questions, because that, that is part of being able to give scrutiny, not just sort of like say yes to everything. Um, so those are my top three to, yeah, to care, uh, to see ahead, and yeah, to always always ask questions. Thanks, David. Peter, what do you think? Um, yes, I agree with everything that uh, Jay and David has said. Um, probably two words that sum it up to a, a large degree are accountability and transparency, just to add to what um, have been the others two have said. Um, the, um, the ability to make decisions. Um, sometimes you just have to make the tough decisions. For example, when we were uh, two days out from Hui Funo and COVID hit, we had to make really a tough decision. Now we were committed, everyone was committed on the ground in Gisborne, um, but tough calls had to be made. And sometimes um, they're not easy calls, and they're not necessarily the call you'd make for yourself if you are uh, making that call about what you are intending to do. But because you're making it for an organization, you have to take the reputation of the organization into account. And um, yeah, they're not easy decisions, but you just have to make them. Cheers. Right, have we got another question? How do you know that the board or the governance group is doing a good job. How do you measure your success? Catherine? We can measure our success by um, um, the strategy that, that, that the board is, uh, um, is aligned to and whether or not we're moving in the right direction. Um, and you can have all the, all, the, all the measures and things like that. But I think, you know, how do you know if, if your board is doing well? I think you just, for me, it would be seeing how um, what what taking the temperature of the sector a little bit, or taking, or you know, actually getting a sense from the, the sector, the organisation you're governing. Um, have we kind of got this right? Or the wider stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. You know, I, th I think you know, if, if, if 
if you started with Peter, he would give a lot more restructured, you know, answer. There are, there are, there are measures and indicators that you can gauge. But I think it, it is, for me, and that goes back to that, what Pali was saying about, you know, our, our, the people around the table. You know, for me, it's kind of, you feel it. You feel it in the board. You feel it when you're at the conference. You feel it when you're out there. You know, are we, are we, um, are we doing a good job or not? And you like to think if you're not, you know, and I actually think with the, this, what I'm, the more I get to know the sector, I think I'd be pretty, not shy. I wouldn't be shy in telling you that the board is not doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's mine. Um, and I get, a, and I get the sense now that we, you know, that we're, we're on track. You know, we're, 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 we are doing a good job. Um, but there you go, that's mine. Sure, right. thank you. Ali, this will be our last question. Uh, why would someone want to join a governance group? Sounds like a lot of listening. Well, why would they want to join a governance group? Oh my gosh. Probably because they've got no life. Oh. Um, <laughs> Put them on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, se seriously, um, we need really good governance to make sure that um, the communities that we serve get what they deserve. Easy. So if you're somebody who um, is sitting around wanting to join a board for whatever reason, that's a good place to start. Do we really think that this, the community deserves what they deserve? Yeah. Can I be a person that can govern and influence so that they get it? Yeah. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a good reason to want to become a board member. I spoke in Auckland to three Pacific providers where the mothers uh, were, were put on board. They were just put on boards. They were voluntold to go on boards just because they had kids in the school. Um, and somebody said to them, oh, that there's no sitting fee or there's no... And um, I really felt for them because, um, you know, to to go on that board and, and not be remunerated um, for the wisdom that they were providing for the school was not a good thing. And so there's a tension, there is a tension there, I think, when there are some people that are on boards because it's remunerative. I mean, if you're John Key on the New Zealand board, I mean, that's your salary for the year, isn't it? But if you're someone that's at a school board getting nothing, but I see both those positions as vital to the energy of the community. Um, but one lot's, you know, it's the parity thing. One lot's, one lot is not getting it, and so um, a good, a good reason to be on the board for me is not really because it's remunerative, but it's helpful. And so, in the sector where I work, um, I always encourage people to be on governance because it does help to get the services and the provisions for the communities where we serve. The second thing is if the communities where you serve is of a diverse nature, it's really important for diverse people to be on a board, to be that voice. And we may not be able to represent that particular culture, but we can advocate. So being parky on the board, you can advocate for Pacific, probably not represent Pacific, but if you're there, um, it's a good reason to be on the board. And the last thing I think is that, um, uh, we have to, Peter said it, uh, being accountable. It's good to be on the board if you're accountable in every other way in your life. You know, people that sometimes you get on the board just because they're brown or they're a minister of a church, but they're not accountable. So it's good to be on the board if you're accountable for the other areas of your life, because that's going to be helpful when the decisions are made or when there's administering um, resources then the accountability is really important. So I think that's probably my three things. Kia ora. Thanks, Ali. So we are near the end of our time together. Thank you very much um, for your um, contribution today. Um, lots of stuff to think about, and I will be actually looking at the recording later just to catch up and remember what you've said. Um, Anyone got any final words of wisdom they'd like to share? Can I just give one little example, Tai, um, of a treaty-led 
organization. Um, very quick story, a real true story in my life. I was managing a DHB in Auckland a number of years ago. And my boss said to me, can you just look at the budget? I need you to, of your, um, of your service. At that time, the budget was at a, a quarter of a million. And I looked at the, um, the, the budget lines and in the budget line, the existing budget line at the time, they had $3,000 and the word koha next to it. So I took the budget home and I reworked it and gave it back to my boss. When we had that meeting on it, she said to me, um, the koha's missing. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And I said, the whole quarter of a million is koha. The whole budget is koha, not just the $3,000 or whatever it is. So I think when a treaty led organization, you have to be brave to make decisions like that, where you have to tell your boss, well, actually, to be treaty led and we're a government agency, um, the whole quarter of a million is treaty led. Just wanted to put that there, some thoughts. Oh, uh, I didn't get sacked. <laughs> and I'm not even Maori. So there. And I continued on in that role for a number of years. Good of Bali. So we are at the end. Um, so I just would like to thank you, um, Jay, Catherine, Peter, David, Bali. Thank you for um, spending time with us today. Um, the, our board members go above and beyond. They just sit in their car. That's where they do all their mahi. Um, <laughs> working hard for us. Um, thank you everyone else for joining us today. Um, just to finish with a quick karakia. Kia tau, kia tato katoa, te ayo, te aroha, me te maru tau, tihei mauri ora. May peace, love and safety be upon us all, tihei mauri ora. Thank you very much.